I'm singing Arunadaya Kirtan. Arunadaya Kirtan in the songbook. Odilo Aruna Pura Babhagi Dvijamani Ghora Mani Jage You know the song? You don't know it? Huh? Aruna Daya Kirtan Bhaktivinoda Thakur It's uh, ecstatic Eternal Sangha, to be sung in, at dawn. It's a morning song, top it, describing Lord Chaitanya going out on Sankirtan and doing, chanting the holy name, telling people to get up and wake up. There's two parts. The first part, Odila Arna Pura Babhagi Vijamani Ghora Mani Jage. Vakata Samuha Loela Sati Jela Nagara Brahati Tatai Tatai Bajala Ko Gana gana kahe janjera ro Rene dalla dalla sonara anga Charani no pura bhaje Mukunda Madhava Yadava Hari Bole na Bola Re Pantana Bori Mukunda Madhava Ivasa Shari Rasahate Emana Dullabha Mana Vadeho Kayaki Koro Bhavana Keho Ebena Bajile Yashoda Sutta Charane Pori Bilaje Odita Kakana Hoyle Asa Dina jello bole hai baby asta Dina jello bole hai baby asta Habe ke noe be alasa hoi 
Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Narayanam Namaskrityam Naram Chaiva Narotamam Devim Sarasatim Vyasam Tato Jaya Mudhirayat Nasta Praeshu Vabhadreshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Shloke Bhakti Bhavati Naishtaki We're reading Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 6, Chapter number 16, Maharaj Chitraketu meets the Supreme Lord. This morning, text number 11. Nadata Atma Hi Gunam Na Dosham Na Kriyafalam Udasinavad Asinna Paravara Drig Ishvara Nadata Atmahi Gunam Nadosham Nakriyapalam Udasinavad Asina Paravaradrik Eshwaraha Nadata Atmahi Gunam Nadosham Nakriyapalam Udasinavad Asina Paravaradrik Eshwara Nadata Atmahi Gunam Nadosham na kriyapalam Udasinavad asina Paravara drigeshwara Nadata atmahi gunam Nadosham na 
Na, not, adate, accepts, atma, the Supreme Lord, he, indeed, gunam, happiness, na, not, dosham, unhappiness, na, nor, kriyafalam, the result of any fruit of activity. Udasina vat. Exactly like a neutral man. Asina. Sitting in the core of in the core of the heart. Para avaradrik. Seeing the cause and effect. Ishwaraha, the Supreme Lord. Translation The Supreme Lord, Atma, the creator of cause and effect, does not accept the happiness and distress that result from fruit of actions. He is completely independent of having to accept a material body and because he has no material body, he is always neutral. The living entities being part and parcel of the Lord possess his qualities in a minute quantity. Therefore, one should not be affected by lamentation. Uh. Purport. The conditioned soul has friends and enemies. He is affected by the good qualities and the faults of his position. The Supreme Lord, however, is always transcendental because he is the Ishwara, the Supreme Controller. He is not affected by duality. It may therefore be said that he sits in the core of everyone's heart as the neutral witness of the causes and effects of one's activities, good and bad. We should also understand that 
udasina, neutral, does not mean that he takes no action. Rather, it means that he is not personally affected. For example, a court judge is neutral when two opposing parties appear before him, but he still takes action as the cause warrants. To become completely neutral, indifferent to material activities, we should simply seek shelter at the lotus feet of the Supreme Neutral Person. Maharaj Chitraketu was advised that remaining neutral in such trying circumstances as the death of one's son is impossible. Nevertheless, since the Lord knows how to adjust everything, the best course is to depend upon Him and do one's duty in devotional service to the Lord. In all circumstances, one should be undisturbed by duality, as stated in Bhagavad Gita 2.47. Karmani evadikaraste mapaleshu kadachana na karma palahe turbur mate sangosva karmani. You have a right to perform your prescribed duty, but you are not entitled to the fruits of action. Never consider yourself to be the cause of the results of your activities and never be attached to not doing your duty. One should execute one's devotional duty and for the results of one's actions one should depend upon the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chatsurun Nilitanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Vanchakaupataravyasya Kripasindu Vaimacha Padya Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya So we're hearing from the son of Maharaj Chitraketu, who had been brought back to life by the mystic power of Narada Muni. And this, this boy who had died but come back to life is explaining about the soul, he was explaining about the living entity. And now he's explaining about the Supreme Lord. We heard about the living entity, the Jivatma. Now we're going to hear about the Paramatma, the Supreme Lord. And it's described here that he is the creator of the cause and effect. We had the opportunity Sometimes we go places, we want to do things, you can't do them, we're restricted. The Lord in the heart is overseeing everything. He's the witness to all of our activities. So he's described here as the cause, the creator of cause and effect. 
in the Brahma Samhita, we, he's described as the cause of all causes. But here he's described as the creator of cause and effect. And he doesn't accept happiness and distress that are usually the results of different fruitive actions. For the Lord, everything is transcendental. Sometimes the Lord may be angry, sometimes he may lament. Just like when Mother Yashoda was chasing him in Damodar Leela, you have Lord Krishna shedding tears and crying, lamenting. So, what is it that we have to understand the transcendental nature of Lord Krishna's lamentation? That although he appears to be lamenting like an ordinary child, it was all transcendental bliss in the loving relationship between Mother Yashoda and Lord Krishna. So for the Lord, the Supreme Lord, there's no real happiness and distress. He doesn't perform activities to enjoy the results. At the same time, he likes to enjoy. He likes activities and he enjoys. He does like to enjoy. But he doesn't enjoy in the manner in which we conditioned souls enjoy. His pleasure is all transcendental. It is above the modes of the material nature. Our activities are all bound by the modes of nature. We have to rise above the modes. So Lord Krishna describes you do karma yoga. If you do karma yoga, then you don't get reactions from the work. Karma yoga was described by Lord Krishna to Arjuna because Arjuna was reluctant to fight. And one of the reasons why he didn't want to take part in the battle at Kurukshetra, he was worried about the, re the reactions which would come. But Lord Krishna told him, if you fight as karma yoga, there's no reaction. And Prabhupada in the purport quotes that famous verse, karmani eva adhikaras te, that Lord Krishna is saying, adhikar, Arjuna, your adhikar, your qualification is to do karma, is to do work. You know, his, uh, Lord Krishna said, your, your qualification is to work. But, mapali shukadachana, you are not entitled to the results of the work. That is for Krishna. We like to work, but we all work for the results. We want the result, the fruit of the work. We think that's for me. I will. But Lord Krishna said, you do karma yoga, you work without the result. Of course, karma yoga can also be impersonal. The impersonalists, they also do karma yoga. You go to the Mayavadi ashram, you go to, you know, divine life yoga or something like that. You know, they'll ask you, would you like to do some karma yoga? Ganesham Prabhu, would you like to do some karma yoga? And they'll give you the bucket and the mop and they'll say, you know, clean the floor or cut the vegetables or wash the pots or something. And, and you do it, you do it just as a service, just to help the ashram, right? We, we do it in a detached mood. That karma yoga it's about being detached, working in a detached manner. In Chinese they say ego. Would you like to do ego? People do. They all like to do ego. Many people come and do ego. We have to engage people in this way. Karma yoga. 
we of course generally we speak about bhakti yoga here but karma yoga is much more possible bhakti yoga you have to be transcendentally situated to actually do bhakti yoga you should be on the transcendental platform but karma yoga is something which ordinary people can take up and they can purify themselves by doing karma yoga by working in a detached way and just like we, when we had Rathi Yatra, there was a lot of people involved a lot of people were engaged in Krishna's service they were given service to do and they get the benefit of doing work that karma yoga what is the effect of the karma yoga purifies one it helps one to become detached and it brings the mercy of devotees if, if the devotee sees somebody working then the devotee will take an interest in them and they will encourage them to go further to come forward and take up more take up and go higher, go on and start to chant. Go ask, are you chanting yet, Prabhu? No, I'm not chanting. Oh, you hear, take a big bag, you know, you start chanting. You know, we don't want you just to cut the vegetables all your life. We want you also to start chanting, come to the platform of devotion. So, Karma Yoga. Is, is something which helps us to come to bhakti yoga, connects us. Karma yoga is close to bhakti yoga. With the karma yoga there's detachment and that detachment makes it easier for us to take up bhakti yoga. All right, so the living entity, the jiva who is speaking, this dead boy, who came back to life, he's telling us about the Supreme Lord. That the Supreme Lord, he doesn't desire the result from activities. That is the mood of the, the Supreme Lord. He doesn't desire any result. He is detached from everything. We are attached. And then the living entity goes on and said, the Lord is completely independent of having to accept a material body. He is, the Lord, he doesn't accept a material body. He, he may come in this world, but he won't come in a material body. As Lord Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Apajananti Mamudha Manushim Tanamashritam Parambhava Majananto Mama Buddha the, the foolish mock at me descending amongst them like a human being. They do not know my transcendental nature and supreme dominion over all that be. So the Lord doesn't have a material body. He is and because be, because he has no material body, that is why he's independent about accepting a material body. Because he doesn't, he doesn't have a material body. So it doesn't concern him. And he is always neutral. Neutral. The example was given in the purport about the judge in the court. The judge in the court is neutral. But at the same time, he may punish one man and he may reward another man. But he is neutral. He's not biased or prejudiced. He has to be neutral. And the Lord is like that. The Lord says, Samoham Sarva Bhuteshu Name Dvishosti Nambriya. I envy no one, I'm equal to everyone. But still, whoever renders service to me, he is in me and I am in him. So the Lord is always neutral. The living entities, 
being part and parcel of the Lord, possess his qualities in a minute quantity. So we are the tiny parts. We are the amsha. He is the vibhin amsha. He is infinite. Everywhere we are limited in one place. So our, the relationship is like that between the speck of gold and the gold mine. You may have one little grain of gold, but the Lord is like the gold mine. The qualities are the same, but in different quantity. So we understand the relationship between the Lord and the living entity in that way. So the, the, the living entity, the, this dead boy who is speaking, he said, therefore we should not be affected by lamentation. He's arguing that there's no reason to lament. If you understand your spiritual nature, then there's nothing to be lamented. One man asked Srila Prabhupada about Arjuna how Arjuna's son was killed on the battlefield, Abhimanu. So when Abhimanu was killed on the battlefield, did Arjuna lament? Because just a few days earlier, before the battle of Kurukshetra began, Lord Krishna had spoken the Bhagavad Gita to him. And in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna had said things like, the wise lament neither for the living nor the dead. In other words, you know, somebody who, who's wise, they, they, they understand that death is just simply the change of body. So there's no reason to lament. Lord Krishna had explained all that in the when he spoke Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna. So, when Abhimanu was killed on the battlefield, did Arjuna lament? Did he? Did he lament? Yes, he did. Yeah, the Pandavas lamented. They were all grieved. It was very painful, heartbreaking for them. Abhimanu was the most loved child. He was a very dear child of Arjuna conceived in the womb of Subhadra. What's Subhadra? Uttara. Uttara. No. Uttara. Uttara was the wife of Abhimanu. Uttara was the wife. The mother was Subhadra. So Arjuna had married Subhadra and they had this child Abhimanu and he was killed in the battle in an unfair manner that the Kauravas surrounded him and they, they, they were, it was not a fair fight. The odds were against him. The whole number of Maharatis were all around him and so they killed him, they cut him to shreds. So the, the Pandavas were very grief-stricken when he was killed in this way. But what to do? Arjuna lamented, the Pandavas all lamented, but the next day Arjuna went out and fought. And the next day Arjuna had vowed that he would kill Jayadrata because it was Jayadrata who was responsible for the death of Abhimanu. Jayadrata had a, a benediction that he could hold back the Pandavas. The Pandavas wanted to come to see Abhimanu, but Jayadrata held them back. So the next day Arjuna vowed that he was going to kill Jayadrata. And of course the Kauravas, they were trying to protect Abhimanu, because they were trying to protect Jayad Jayadrata. And they thought, if we can save Jayadrata, Arjuna will have to give up his life if he cannot keep his vow. And so they, 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 they fought all day and the Kauravas were keeping the Pandavas away from Jayadrata 
They kept Jaidrat away at the back. And it came almost to the end of the day. And the Kauravas were thinking, we're successful, Arjuna will have to give up his life, he'll have to commit suicide. But Lord Krishna arranged a trick. He arranged the sunset and then they stopped fighting, everybody stopped, oh the day's over. But then suddenly the sun rose again. And at that time Arjuna took the opportunity to kill Jayadrata. So, by the grace of Lord Krishna, Arjuna could keep his vow. But the point, the point was that Arjuna lamented when Abhimanu died, but he went out and fought, he got revenge, he didn't stop fighting, he didn't give up the battle. So this is the point that uh, even you may be transcendentally situated, you, you can still lament. You can, lamentation will be there. Maharaj Chitraketu, we see actually he's, he's a, a, an advanced yogi. He's a very advanced personality, but he's not aware of it. He's, he's, be, he's fallen into this, this bodily conception of life and he's been identifying with himself as a king and as a king he wants a son to continue the line on the throne and he made great efforts to get a son and then finally he got the son but the son died and it was very painful for Maharaj Chitraketu. But these pains are all for us to learn. It's a failure is the pillar of success and by accepting pain and hardships and failure we learn to go on and to start and to continue our battle against the material energy. We don't give up although we may have fallen we may have had so many difficulties in, in our efforts to fight against Maya, we don't give up the battle, we keep fighting. And Maharaj Chitraketu, he's going to learn also that although his son has died, his son is dead, but there's no reason to lament. The son is gone to take birth some other place. He's going to go on and take birth some other place. So the relationships in the material world are like that. We come together, we spend some time together, and then in course of time we're separated. Of course, it's painful because we do become attached, we do identify with people and relationships. But we have to rise up to the transcendental platform, understand the real nature of the world and not be bewildered by things. Certainly it's easy to become bewildered, but again we have to put ourselves back on the correct path. Just like Arjuna on the battlefield, he was bewildered, he didn't want to fight. And he spoke philosophically to Krishna, telling Lord Krishna he didn't want, why he didn't want to fight. But Krishna defeated all of his arguments and convinced him. And Arjuna was convinced and he said, yeah, now I've heard everything from, now I'm ready to fight, I'm ready to, I have to fight. So, the same way we have to understand the nature of material life. That there are pains, there are problems, there are difficulties. We have to accept them, but we have to go on. You know, people who go to the gym, many people, they go to the gym and lift weights, right? They go and lift weights, build the muscles. 
And what's this, what do they say? They say, no pain, no gain. Right? Yeah, you go to the gym, you build a muscle, and then you rip the muscle. You have to tear the muscle to build a new muscle on top of the other muscle. So they build one muscle on top of another muscle. And they tear the old muscle to put the new muscle, for the new muscle to grow on top of the old muscle. So no pain, no gain. Right? So material life is like that also. Without pain, we don't learn the real nature of the world and we don't learn to go on to higher things. The pains which we endure are the greatest experience, the greatest blessing for us to go on to the higher pleasures of life. So the difficulties which we undergo, they help us to grow spiritually. The more we have difficulties, the more we learn to grow, to overcome the material nature and to come to the spiritual platform. And we see in the lives of so many great personalities how they had difficulties, how they accepted difficulties to go on to higher things. All right, any question? Any comment? Yes, Guru Chandra Prabhu? Any difficulties? <laughs> Not today. <laughs> Not this morning, right? Yes, Maridi? Karma means karma means highest activity or is get result for the action. Karma can mean both these things. Karma can mean you get reactions. And it can all, karma, the word karma generally means activity. So it can be work, it can be pious work, it can be acts, acts according to the Vedas. There are three words, there's karma, akarma and vikarma. Vikarma are acts against the scriptures. Akarma means devotional service work with devotion, without karma. But karma means performing acts according to the Vedic regulation. So as you said, pious activities will bring good results. But the word karma in a general sense simply means work. Somebody is doing work. So somebody may do we, we all have some karma. We have taken birth in this world because of our karma. So we have some good karma, we have some bad karma. You have some good karma, you're healthy, you're educated like that, good karma. We have some bad karma, maybe we have debts, maybe we have, we have the job is not good, we're not happy in the work. Like, the bad karma. So, we have karma from many things. The country we're born in, we get karma. The family we're born in, we get karma. We get karma from our ancestors even. Maybe in the past, maybe your ancestors, maybe they, they were very pious. So you enjoy that karma, or maybe they were sinful, so then we suffer some karma for that. Maybe they have debts which were not paid, and so they, these kind of things gives us some bad karma. So we get karma from many different things. Everything we're doing, we get karma. The food we eat, the water we drink, karma is, oh, there's karma in everything. So we have to be Krishna conscious, 
If we do everything with devotion for the pleasure of the Lord, then there's no karma. Just like before we drink water, we will say, Shri Vishnu, Shri Vishnu, Shri Vishnu. We will pray to Lord Vishnu that please purify this water. Or, I recognize you as the proprietor. This water is your mercy and I'm drinking understanding that you have given me this water. Like that, that consciousness has to be there. We offer our food. We don't just eat, we eat prasada, food which has been offered to Krishna. And that way, then you avoid karma. If everything is done in relation to the Lord, no karma. A karma. Yes, Prabhu. How do we take lesson from Arjuna? But Arjuna is a devotee, pure devotee of Krishna, one devotee, but he himself is levitating over the death of Apimadu. And how do we take that as a lesson to us as a real devotee? How do we take when someone who beat the left, uh, left the body, for example, our parents, when we our parents, our wife, our children, how do we actually? Uh, come out from the levitation. Like what, like how are we not deep? We don't know if it's but he also levitates. But what about us? This is not advanced Arjun. How can we take as a lesson of reflection? Yes, we have to understand that it is natural that there will be some lamentation, that we will lament the loss of a loved one someone very dear to us and they depart from the world, particularly if they depart suddenly, unexpectedly, will be shocked. It's very painful for us. But we go on because we have transcendental knowledge. We understand that somehow this is the plan of the Lord. Everything happens under the direction of the Lord. It's not by chance. So we have to understand somehow the Lord has, some, has made this arrangement to take this person away from us. So we should think that the Lord must have some other service more important for that person. Therefore they have taken the person away. Just like Abhimanu, it is said that be before he took his birth as Abhimanu, he was the son of a, a, well, some powerful demigod. Maybe it was the sun god or something. But he was the son of a powerful demigod. And the demigod didn't like that Abhimanu was going to, that he was going, to, that his son was going to go down to earth to take part and the pastimes of the Lord. So it was arranged that he would come back quickly, that although he would go there, he would come back quickly. And so it happened in that way, that he was killed in the battle. And when a Kshatriya is killed on the battlefield, then of course they go back to God. There, the doors to liberation are opened. It's a glorious death to die on the battlefield, right? Prabhupada said, I want that benediction. To die on the battlefield is glorious. And the Kshatriya, want, he doesn't want to die retreating. He doesn't want to die going back. He wants to die going forward. And this, this is the mood of the Kshatriya. And Prabhupada said he wanted that benediction. He said, I want to die on the battlefield preaching Krishna consciousness. Many people, they would go to the West, they'd get some money, they'd come back and just live comfortably 
and pass their lives enjoying money. But Srila Prabhupada taught us, we don't want to just live a comfortable life. We want to give our life fully for the service of Lord Krishna. So we have to be fixed in transcendental knowledge. And we have to understand the plan of the Lord. He brings us together with people and He will separate us in course of time. But we're all eternal spirit souls and we're all part and parcel of Lord Krishna. We're all just instruments in His hands and we have to surrender. So we have to see the plan of the Lord behind everything. Nimita Matra Bhava Savya Sanchin Become an instrument in the service of the Lord. So in this way we understand Arjuna's lamentation. It wasn't for long. For some time he lamented, but quickly again the next day he went to battle. So we're not callous. We do care about others. And we do have feelings. We're persons. So we have feelings, we have emotions. We may not be so transcendental, but still we have to apply spiritual knowledge. And in this way we can be properly situated. Who? Oh, when we engage people to do service, are they doing bhakti yoga or karma yoga? Well, it depends on their attitude. If they're doing it for Krishna, then that's bhakti yoga. But if they're just simply doing it in a detached manner because someone asks them to help out, then it's karma yoga. Hmm? Everything depends on the attitude. So bhakti yoga, the attitude has to be that I'm doing this for Krishna. Okay, Hare Krishna, Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai, Shura Prabhupada Ki.